Today we conclude our series anchored serving the life of Jonah. Some of us would think that Jonah is an exception, that Jonah is an enigma, but in reality, Jonah is a supernatural glimpse into the heart of men, women, and children that God is calling to himself. Jonah is not an exception. In fact, Jonah looks more like most of us than we're ready to admit. Uh, Jonah makes us realize that Although God's love is relentless, although God's love is committed, although God's love is steadfast towards us because of our preferences, because of our unique experiences, and in some cases, dare I say, even because of our prejudices, it's complicated. If I had to give a title to today as we dive into the very last message, the finale of this series, I would simply title that, our status and our relationship with God is, it's complicated. Got your Bible, run with me to Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me. What is better for me to die than to live? Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be that was your part. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Not one of us, under the sound of my voice, or those that will listen to the podcast on iTunes later, or those that will go to YouTube or Vimeo that subscribe to this, or those that will listen on the app, not one of us who names the name of Jesus and calls ourselves followers of Jesus not one of us did that on our own. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we were dead in sins and trespasses, and then God quickened us or made us alive and then drew us to himself. There's not one of us that raised our hand or answered a prayer or got on our knees or someone on the street witnessing to us or however you first named faith in Christ, not one of us did that on our own. It was God's grace and mercy pursuing us like a hound and tracking us down and slowly bringing our hearts to the place that we drew to him. In fact, on the day that we responded, little did we know God had been working for a long period of time on us. And here we find Jonah on the heels of the greatest revival in biblical history. Scan your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Never at any other time in the historical account of the scriptures did 120,000 people come to Christ or turn to God or repent at one time. But here Jonah is there and 120,000 people have turned the same grace, the same mercy, the same drawing that had happened and was continuing to happen in Jonah's life had gone to the Ninevites, those that were Assyrians living in Nineveh, and Jonah was upset about it. Jonah is not an exception. Jonah is not an enigma. Jonah is not some random leap year in the years that come. Jonah is a picture of the storms that are within our heart. Jonah literally is a supernatural EKG or X-ray that goes up to our spirits, as it were, and shows us how complicated we are within. In fact, Jonah today is going to help us to lay it all out as if the doctor had given us an ultrasound or something. We'll be able to say, yup, that's right where I am. I look more like Jonah than I care to admit. Not it's complicated. I am complicated. And if you believe, God, that that's true about you, you could put your head down, do it under a cough, however you want, just say, I'm complicated, however you want to do it. But, but would you just make that faith confession that God might do something supernatural in us today 
and move us to the place where we're more simply a yes and an amen than we are <coughs> complicated. Jonah chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. Catch this. And the Lord prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful to the Lord. Is that not what it says? Uh, so Jonah was very grateful for what God had done. So Jonah rejoiced and thanked God for knowing how to do what he could not do. No, it says, so Jonah was very grateful for the, for the plant. Why don't we celebrate the grace of God more? Why don't we acknowledge and, and lift our hands and give praise for the generosity, the goodness, the miraculous evidence of God in our lives more? Why, 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 why do we celebrate the plants more than the one who miraculously makes the plants come in our lives? Why do we focus on the shelters that we build with our own hands when the shelters can't do anything near what the plants that he made grows do in our lives? Can I submit for your consideration that it's because of self-righteousness? We give ourselves more credit for the shelter than we give God for the plants. Self-righteousness makes me say, yeah, God moved in my life, but of course, because I pray and I'm at church on every Sunday and I was there for the first Wednesday and I never miss a peace cell. No wonder he's not moving in their lives. They're lazy, but I work hard. So, of course, God moved in my life. I built a shelter over my life. Self-righteousness somehow ends up in the place that in the narrative of God moving in our lives, we drift back to what we did more than we see what God did in our lives. And Jonah is guilty of this. Jonah turns around and praises the plant for the plant coming, but he can't praise the God who miraculously made a plant appear out of nowhere. How many of you have plants just appear out of nowhere in your life? Would you praise him for his grace? Would you celebrate his goodness? Would you just say something out of your mouth that he did that? Sometimes we're so focused on the stuff we build with our hands and the stuff we want him to do that we end up having an attitude because he didn't do what I wanted to do and can't even see the plant. Sometimes we end up looking like this baby on the screen. I mean, the true story about this baby is daddy loved you so much that he picked you up full of joy, held you up in the air. And it's like, my boy, my baby, I just want my boy to feel like he's above everything, just soaring in the world. I want him to feel the wind blowing through him. I want him to feel the joy. But the self-righteous baby says, Dad, would you get your hands off of me? You're holding me back. I could have touched the top of the trees if it wasn't for how short your arms are. Let me go. I could get up to the top of this tree and pick an apple for myself. The self-righteous kid says, you see my ups? I leaped in the air up this high. Then my dad put his hands up under me to help me land back down safely. Thanks, dad. But, but look how high I can jump. Self-righteousness always ends up making us more the hero in the stories that we tell. Self-righteousness always makes us wiser than what we were. By the time we get done telling the story, God is a little footnote in the story. But I knew what to do because I, I had been in the God. I was the wise one. Self-righteousness has us like the baby that's lifted up in air. Self-righteousness can't even see the arms of God that are holding us up. And self-righteousness says, can't you see I can fly? There's a flip side to self-righteousness. Some of you are saying, that's not me. Yeah, you're right, because some of our self-righteousness says, God, I could never do that. I know other people can do that, but I can't do that. As if we could arrive at some place that then we uniquely qualify ourselves to be used by God. Self-righteousness has a flip side. If I'm not always the hero, I'm always the, the victim. 
Self-righteousness is a flip side. If I'm not the one, always the wisest one, I'm always the one like I couldn't even control it. That's why I'm stuck here. Somehow it still focuses on our rightness or our degree of wrongness that ends up being the thing that helps qualify God. Somehow self-righteousness always makes us the hero in our own Netflix series. And God becomes a supporting character. But actually it's titled The Chronicles of Kevin. You know, oh, yeah, and God, really small font down at the bottom. You know, he helped me do a little bit, but, but this is what was going on with Jonah. Self-righteousness had him thinking he earned or deserved something, and the Ninevites were not of the same quality or the same character that he was, so therefore they didn't deserve it. Did you really deserve it, Jonah? Did you really earn it, Jonah? Is it your self-righteousness, Jonah? You're knowing what was right, your choices, your wisdom, your hard work and your ingenuity, is that what has you where you are? Somehow we celebrate the plants more than we celebrate the one that makes them grow for us. Not talking about anybody in here. I'm talking about those of us that are complicated because one of the first ingredients that helps to make storms in our lives is we see ourselves bigger than we are. Just put your head down and nobody will have a clue that the Holy Spirit is talking to us right now. But self-righteous pride ends up reducing all of us to fools. And the foolish decisions that we make, we're convinced that they're wise because, after all, I know best. Just rest in that for a moment. Lord, I pray that you would open up the eyes of our understanding. Uh, God, I pray that you would make out of us a people that are ready for you to grow things and do things and be things in our lives that we never could. And God, rather than your miraculous moves hurting us because we give ourselves credit for them, I pray, God, that you will find in us a people that celebrate, a people that rejoice, a people that glorify, a people that acknowledge, a people that point to you so that miracles don't end up crippling us by us thinking we did it or we earned it, but miracles end up causing us to soar in your strong arms. As we, as we lift up your name, you end up causing us, Lord God, to be promoted in your plans and your purposes for these days that you've planted us in. We believe right now we receive what you have in mind and we open ourselves up in a way we could not on our own to hear what God is saying to us now in the mighty name of Jesus. Run with me to verse 7. But God, pardon me, but as morning dawned, the next day, God prepared a worm. And it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Let me read it again. But as morning dawned, somebody say the sun was coming up. The next day, as the calendar turned, God prepared a worm. And the worm that God had prepared when the sun came up on the next day is so damaged the plant that Jonah celebrated rather than giving God glory for that that plant withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God also prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me, this is your part, to die than to live. The plant that God caused to miraculously grow was greater than the shelter that Jonah built with his hands. Let's say it again. The plant that God caused to come out of nowhere was more significant and greater than what Jonah built with his own hands. 
But sometimes we end up having more confidence, more love, and more affection for the stuff that we build with our hands than we do for the God that ends up building the plant that does what our shelter could have never done. The Bible says that God ate up the plant and made the plant go away. But what happened to the shelter that Jonah built? Why did that still work for him? Because sometimes the shelters we build and give ourselves so much credit for cannot stand up to the things that God knows are coming. So God builds things to protect. But when we don't give God glory for the plants, sometimes in his goodness and in his mercy, he'll eat our plants up. Let me bring it home. Sometimes I'd rather be dependent on what I build more than I'd rather be dependent on God. If self-righteousness doesn't consume me enough, self-centeredness comes. Look what I built. Look what I did. And God is so good and gracious, he'll eat up the stuff that he put in place and make us realize that what we've done on our own is not enough. Some of our plants are a 401ks. Some of our plants are, I got four more weeks left on unemployment. I'm good. I got it planned out. Some of our plants are, when, when this is over, I already got my resume ready. The recruiter's already calling me on new jobs. I know what I'm going to do next. Matter of fact, I got three possible offers that will be there. I kind of charted my course, and that's our plant. For others of us, it actually is, uh, my credit line is what secures me, and You know, I know that I've got this amount of my credit cards. I got this much of my business credit line. You know, even if all hell breaks loose, I'm still good. And we've got confidence in these things. But sometimes God comes in the stuff he did because he did the job. He did the unemployment. He was behind that. He's the one that made those grow and provide for us. And when we don't recognize that, sometimes he'll come and just eat the 401k. Just eat the remaining four weeks. Just eat up the credit line. He's not doing that because he wants to destroy us. He's doing that because self-centeredness is destroying us. Jonah turns around and said, if I can't get my way, if I can't secure myself, if I can't make you, God, work for me rather than me work for you, then I'd rather just die. How often do we do that? God, I can't believe it. I've been serving you. I've been giving. I've been faithful. And now you don't let my little bit of stuff that I stored up dry up what he's doing. Catch this. Because if self-righteousness, where I'm the one that jumped in the air, doesn't get us, then self-centeredness comes and tries to consume us. Jonah had both of them consuming him. This man was, was called by God. This man had been prepared by God. This man had been saved by God. He had been redeemed by God. He couldn't give God credit for the boat that didn't kill him. He couldn't give God credit for the sea that didn't kill him. He couldn't give God credit for the whale or the belly that didn't kill him. He couldn't give God credit for, for the move of God that had happened, 120,000 coming. So finally, God even takes the little plant from him. When will we just see God moving and give God glory and celebrate God? Because when we see him moving, catch this, when we learn to see him moving, then we learn to see him moving. I didn't say the same thing twice. When we learn to see him moving, then we learn to see him moving. I'll do it again. When we learn to see him moving, then we learn to see him moving. So often, though, when we can't see him moving, then we can't see him moving. Because the one that we end up giving credit to is us. The one that we end up giving credit to is the right that I've done. And if that wasn't bad enough, self-centeredness and self-righteousness also was connected to us then judging everybody else. And this is exactly what is consuming our brother Jonah. Jonah is not an enigma. Jonah is not an exception. Jonah is showing the complicated nature of what goes on inside the hearts of the men, women, children that God is extending himself to and drawing himself to and our responses are complicated you know where they're complicated because we are determined to depend on us we're determined to try to build life centered on us and the toe the undertow in the waters of life are that if I'm not moving towards him then I'm falling back away from him I'll just say it again the current of life the undertows I'm not moving towards him then I'm falling back away from him. There is no I'm just in between. I'm either going or I'm retreating. Somebody just say your neighbor, it's complicated. complicated. Ask him to pray for you. Just say it's complicated. (laughs) Jonah believes that God exists to help accomplish what Jonah wants. 
Jonah doesn't realize that he exists to accomplish what God wants. Jonah thinks that God exists to accomplish what Jonah wants. Jonah doesn't realize that he exists to accomplish what God wants. Jonah thinks that life is centered on his will, his pleasure, his honor, his glory. Jonah doesn't realize that life is centered on God's will, God's pleasure, God's honor, and God's glory. He's confused and it's complicated because when God moves in ways that Jonah did not want him to move or that Jonah did not desire to move, Jonah has a storm that starts with them because self-righteousness and self-centeredness ultimately end up anchoring us in self-delusion. I'll just say it again. Self-righteousness and self-centeredness ultimately end up anchoring us in self-delusion. We'll either be anchored in surrender on going and pursuit on going to God, or we'll drift back into self-righteousness, we'll drift back into self-centeredness, and ultimately those two anchor us in self-delusion. It ain't me, it's them. I did what I was supposed to do. They just won't do what they're supposed to do. The world would be a better place if they would just be better people. Just self-delusion gets me. The old heads just don't understand me and don't get me. The young people just won't listen and follow and do what they're supposed to do. My boss just can't see who I am. God, would you do something? I'm even praying prayers that are delusional because of myself and myself. Sadly, too often... Our lives are purposed for nothing more than our own self-fulfillment and our own self-satisfaction. Let me say it again. Sadly, our lives often end up purposed for nothing more than our own self-fulfillment and self-satisfaction. How many of you have ever had a goal that you were working on for a long time and you accomplished it? Just throw your hand up. Come on, y'all. I know we got some accomplished people in here. How many of you, as you define the American dream, if you look back over your life, for the most part right now, you kind of got the American dream. Like, I, I have, come on, just raise your I know we got some accomplished people in here. But can I tell you that if you ever experienced that, and many of us, so many of us have, you come to the place that you find out that your self-fulfillment and your self-satisfaction ends up being empty when you go to grab it. It's like it's not quite enough. Although we look at Jonah like he's crazy that he wants to die. How many people have we seen that have accomplished stuff that that we would look at and say, I wish I could accomplish that, and end up ruining, shipwrecking their lives, and in some cases even taking their own lives because they worked all their life to get to self-fulfillment and self-satisfaction only to find out that it was a ghost. It was a mirage because our lives were designed for something bigger. Our lives were designed for someone bigger. We were not purposed for our self-fulfillment and self-satisfaction. We were purposed for the will of God. We were purposed for the pleasure of God. And I know for some of us that are so self-centered, hey, well, what about my pleasure? Our pleasure is built into his. Our pleasure is a byproduct of his. Well, not mine, pastor. I need my own special kind of pleasure. See, I've told you that self-centeredness and self-righteousness ends up having us in self-delusion. There's a lie that's been running through humanity since the Garden of Eden. If I give God my full surrender, if I give God my full submission, if I give God my whole yes, then I'll miss happiness. I'll miss fulfillment. Isn't what he said to Adam and Eve in the Garden? He said, God knows that if you eat of this, then you'll become like him. You'll understand the knowledge of good and evil and God is trying to keep you from something somehow we all have this little war going on in ourselves if I fully surrender to God will I be happy Satan has been using that since the garden if I fully obey God and respond the way he would so sometimes my wisdom has to make better choice sometimes dad I don't need your arms I got to jump in the air for myself and that's self-righteousness That self-centeredness that comes to consume us leaves us ultimately delusional. Just say, that ain't nobody in my row. No, by faith, look up at Daniel Rose and say, that ain't nobody in my row. Your neighbor don't even believe you, no. It's heavy in this Methodist church. Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4, 
verse 10. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant. You cried all night about losing your 401k. You stomped around and was so touched so deeply about not having your unemployment going. You got so upset about your credit line. All that. I mean, you were moved to, to such deep passion about it. You have had such pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern, they don't know the difference between their right hand and their left, and much, and, and much livestock. Let me just read this again. But the Lord said, you have pity on the plant, for which you have not labored. You didn't make the company. You didn't make the unable. You didn't make or build any of that. You didn't create any of the systems we're benefiting from. We didn't create the gifts, talents, and abilities that put us there. We can't make those things grow, although we think, well, I went to school and did all. Some people have went to school and never accomplished what you did. God said, I let it come up in the night and I let it perish in the night. Why? Because I want you to learn as I am directing. I, and should I not pity Nineveh? Should I not pick people over plants? That great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. I'm convinced if, if Jonah were able to clearly see himself, it's just hard to believe for me that he would keep exalting plants over people. It's just hard for me to believe that he would he would keep picking a plant over a person that he would mourn and be up so upset over a plant, but he couldn't say anything about Nineveh. I'm just convinced if we could clearly see ourselves, if we'd stop being more concerned about our stuff than we are about people. I'm just kind of convinced of that. I'm just kind of convinced that God, we just need you by your grace and by your mercy to give us a flash of actually seeing our self righteousness, just a flash of seeing our self-centeredness that's made us delusional. If you could just give us a moment of sobriety, God, I think we'd end up saying, no, we care more about people than plants. This is exactly what Jesus was saying to the mother of, of, of the sons of Zebedee. Now, James and John's mama pulls Jesus and say, hey, I, I need to get a word with you. She sees Jesus coming to the end of his earthly ministry, and he's getting ready to leave the earth and go into his kingdom. And she knows that a kingdom has positions and roles and responsibilities. So like any good mama who's championing her baby, she said, Jesus, can I talk to you for a second? And she says, hey, when you enter into your kingdom, Jesus, could you have my son, my baby boys, one of them sitting on your left, one sitting on your right. They've been a part of your, I'm adding to this, but they've been a part of your inner circle all the time. Jesus had 12 disciples, but Peter, James, and John was his inner circle. When he went on the Mount of Transfiguration, he took them. When he went into the Garden of Gethsemane, the others waited there, but he asked them to come further. Like, he had a crew, but he had an inside crew in his crew. James and John was a part of it. Mama peeped in and said, ooh, let me go ahead and keep this going. <laughs> it's obvious he really cares for them. Let me kind of help my boys along. Have you ever talked to the boss, the coach, or somebody on behalf of your baby? Mama, don't lie to me. Let me see your hand. Have you ever prayed to Jesus? Jesus, could you move my son, move my daughter here? Could you do this for them? Do that for them. Daddies, don't lie to me. Don't leave me standing here. <laughs> Sometimes we think we know what position they should be in better than even God's does, so we help him out. So she, she goes, and I can't hate on her. I've done the same. And she, she asks, and listen to Jesus' response. His response is not, you arrogant, self-righteous mama, it's been me bringing these boys along. They shouldn't even be in my inner circle. I've been helping them along. As a matter of fact, you could have done such a better job raising them. He doesn't do any of that. <laughs> Jesus literally says, that's not up to me. Can, can they drink of the cup I'm going to drink? Yep, you know what? Matter of fact, they will. But, but it's not up to me where they will sit on the left or on the right. That's up to the Father. Catch this then. If it's up to the Father where we ultimately end up, if we're to end up where he wants us, then what are we feeling self-righteous about? If, if it's up to the Father where we'll ultimately land, if we're going to land in the will of God, then what good does self-centeredness even do us? If it's really God working and moving more powerfully than any of us could, I'm not saying we don't need to give some effort, but I'm saying our effort is a shelter compared to his plant. 
We're crying over stuff that we shouldn't be crying over. So ultimately, it ends with the idea and the question that this mama comes and trying to find a position because Jonah is trying to find and make a position for himself. I know none of us have ever done that. Jonah's got issues, and let's just keep our focus on him because Jonah is the one that is deceived and trying to make a place for himself. See, self-deception is so good at reasoning and rationalizing the crazy wrong stuff we do and then judging and pointing at and wanting to see the wrath of God come on the silly stuff other folks do. Self-deception is so good at seeing how right we are and, and how much we've worked and how much this should be about us because, hey, I've earned this. I got tenure here, young guy. Go sit down. It's so capable of doing that, but, but never really capable of really just seeing ourselves. Self-deception tells its own truth. Don't we live in an age that celebrates own truth? Everybody got their own truth. Yeah, everybody's got their own self-deception is what it is. And we tell our own truth because in the end, when we go to try to tell our own truth, that's not going to mean anything. It's going to either be a well done or depart from me. I don't think we can build a well done on our own truth. God deliver us. We see your persistence with Jonah. Would you stay persistent with us? Would you stay persistent with me? Would you stay persistent with them? Would you stay persistent with I? Deliver me, God. Send storms. Use fish. Use boats. Use beaches. Use the kitchen sink. Use whatever you can that your grace and mercy might be extended to us, to me, to we. And deliver us from our sense of righteousness, deliver us from our sense of worthy or unworthiness, and deliver us, Lord God, into the center of your thoughts and your mind for us. We're going to go home on this because the, it ends with this at verse 11. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock. The book of Jonah, so many of us once thought that it ended with, yeah, he was in the belly, and he got out the belly. So many of us once thought that the book ended with, yeah, he went and preached to Nineveh, and it was over. No, the book ends with a question. The whole book ends up entering with ending with a question, and, and legitimately the question is literally, are you going to stay, Jonah, Rooted in your self-righteousness, rooted in your self-centeredness, which causes you to be anchored in your self-delusion? Or are you going to come on over here with me and submit yourself in me and surrender and anchor yourself in me so that you see the Ninevites the way that I do, so that you stop exalting plants over people? Are you going to be rooted and anchored over there, or are you going to be rooted and anchored over here? Guess what? We never know what Jonah did. There's no fifth chapter to tell us how Jonah responds. Did Jonah stay sitting outside the city with his arms folded, waiting for God to judge his enemies? Or did Jonah become like Jesus and go outside the city and let him hang him high outside the city and lay down his life and give his life to serve the whole city? What are we going to do? What are we going to be? Could you stand your feet as I read the question one more time? And as our band makes their way to the platform, I just want to read the question one more time, and I'd love it if you would join me. Reading out of the New King James Version, Jonah chapter 4 and verse 11, as we stand together. And should I not pity Nineveh? Let's read it together. And should I not pity Nineveh? that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. Who is God trying to pity through your life? Who is God trying to stir up compassion for in your life? What is God trying to do with us as a church? in one of the most divided cultures since the time of the civil rights, in one of the most polarized and tribalized generations that I've seen in my 52 years on this planet, 
in a world that seems more divided than I can ever remember. And as we get ready to go fully into an election cycle where we are either going to identify as ourselves as Democrats and Republicans, conservatives or liberals, or sons and daughters of God. Are we going to get torn at the seams that, that it's the black and brown people and the, and the white people? Are we, are we going to become torn in our identities of oppressed and oppressor? Are we going to be sons and daughters of God? Are we going to be rooted in our self-righteousness? Are we going to be rooted in our self-centeredness, which makes us delusional? Or are we going to be rooted church? to be a unique witness in our workplace, to be a unique witness in our homes, a unique witness on our blocks, a unique witness even in our own private times that God root me in your righteousness, root me in my life being centered around you, root me into the bigger things that you've called me to do. My self-satisfaction and self-fulfillment is too small of a purpose for life. Are we going to celebrate when God grows the plants over what we built with our hands? Can anybody think of a plant that God made grow, that gave you shelter, that blocked you from the wind, that out of nowhere God came and did something that you know you couldn't do on your own? Let's start practicing celebrating his generosity now. Let's start practicing celebrating his goodness now. Let's just start practicing acknowledging him now. No, not clapping because I said celebrating God on your own so that when God looks at you and looks at your heart, he sees you celebrating his grace, his mercy, what he did that no one could have done. Has he not sent some boats to take you? Has he not sent some fish to swallow you? Has he not sent some storms to turn you back in the right way? Has he not done through your little works stuff that you never could have done on your own? If we see him, then we'll see him. Can we rejoice and celebrate the stuff that grew and came out of nowhere? He is my